Hey there everyone, welcome to the new and updated how to make a Kydex holster video. Uh, several months ago I recorded a video sort of documenting my, uh, my own interest in making Kydex holsters and sort of sharing what I had learned in a sort of do-it-yourself kind of way. And over the months uh, this has really developed into all of an entirely full-time business and I've been making dozens upon dozens of holsters and I've been recording update videos to that original one uh, through, uh, throughout the, uh, the process. And what I wanted to do in, uh, to, to mark the event of a thousand subscribers is to remake entirely the how-to video, complete with part numbers, sources, prices, and every tip and trick that I've uh, learned through the process of doing this. So what we're going to do today is instead of making a demonstration holster, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make an actual holster for a customer today. So what you're going to see here is absolutely everything that we do. There's going to be no hidden information, no secrets, no uh, no proprietary kind of you know uh, trade secret anything. You're going to be able to make after this a holster exactly like this one. Uh, with the same kind of definition, the same kind of retention, the same kind of consistency. I mean, obviously, this things take a little bit of practice, but you're going to be equipped with the, the knowledge to make a custom Kydex holster for yourself. So, I want to, before we get started on that, I want to thank everybody who's uh, watched the original video and has uh, participated in the project. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to even get started if it wasn't for the help of uh, many other people in this community. Guys like Gunfighters Inc. and Century Gun Leather have been really helpful, and as the project's grown, uh, people like Kenpo S7, uh, Shadow Concealment, uh, Garage Holsters, uh, guys like that have really, uh, really helped me along in a lot of ways. I want to give them a shout out. And for those of you guys getting started, if you see somebody out there on YouTube making Kydex holsters and you have questions, everybody that I've met in this community has been exceedingly helpful and generous with their time and knowledge, so give them a shout. I'm sure everybody would be uh, happy to help. I know I certainly am whenever I can, so uh, it's a great community to be a part of, and I have yet to encounter uh, anyone that's turned me off to it, which is, which is really fantastic, and I want to extend a lot of gratitude to everybody out there. So with that being said, let's get started on the uh, materials and price list and availability. So before we get started, we're going to go over uh, a wide variety, if not a totally comprehensive list of supplies and whatnot that you may need to get started on working with Kydex. If you don't mind, since it's a lot of information, I'm going to do a little reading off of this sheet here. Uh, I've gone through and uh, sourced and written down everything that I use so I can share with you. So first things first, you're going to need a heat source. Uh, you can use uh, a toaster oven or a heat gun. Uh, those are the two most popular things. I just picked this guy up for 20 bucks at Lowe's. Uh, obviously you can go to Walmart or Kmart or uh, yard sale and get one for however little you want to spend on it. However, it is ideal that, you know, of course you can achieve 350 degrees worth of heat out of your unit here. You can use a heat gun, but if it doesn't go up that high, you may ultimately uh, get substandard uh, or less than ideal definition because heat is a critical part of getting the, high the Kydex flexible enough to generate the kind of definition that you want. There are some really hot heat guns and if you want to spring for one of those that's great but if you just want to supplement your oven with a heat gun for doing some finer forming it's a, it's a good tool to have. Uh, other people use alternatives such as uh, like an electric griddle. A friend of mine has an electric griddle in his rig, so he just sort of uh, pulls it out of a drawer right here. He can flip the Kydex, you know, over to keep it warming evenly and uh, monitor the temperature that way. In addition to your heat source, you're going to need a press of some kind. This press was built for me by a friend, neighbor, and subscriber. It's what's called a book press. This is the sort of thing that you can build yourself. Uh, if you check out the Filster, P-H-L-S-T-E-R, Facebook page, we have a diagram for a do-it-yourself book press. 
and if you email me, I'll send you the whole PDF file with parts and instructions on how to build one. You can also obtain a hinged press, uh, build one yourself. Uh, the Kenpo 7 has a uh, great video on how to build one and the specifications that he has. Or if you were like me, for the first five, six months I was making these, my press was just this and some clamps, some scrap plywood, some foam, and these big old clamps that I picked up at Home Depot. So the, for me, a book press is ideal because it gives me an even direct pressure. A hinge press is going to give you a lot of potential for things to shift as the press closes, as I'm sure some of you have discovered. But uh, to each their own, you can improvise a crummy little press like I did and get decent results for a long time. You can build something if you're handy, or you can purchase a press from knifekits.com. They've got some really heavy duty ones. Or you can go on our Facebook page and get the instructions for how to make your own book style press. So now that you have heat and pressure, the next critical thing is, and I didn't discover this until much later, this is the keystone of your project. To achieve consistent, clean results with your Kydex, you will need, without a doubt, a way to measure the temperature. If you go to the uh, Kydex technical briefs and uh, read through all that information, you will find that the working temperature for Kydex, and they tell you all three thicknesses, but on average the working temperature for Kydex is approximately 350 degrees. If you try to press it at around 300 degrees, 310 degrees, or even 320 degrees, the crisp, clear, perfect detail definition won't come through quite as much as if you heat it up to 350, 355 degrees and accurately measure that temperature and then place it in the press. So for a long time I eyeballed it. However, uh, it's totally critical that you get yourself some sort of uh, non-contact thermometer for checking this temperature. This one I picked up at Lowe's, it was like 35 bucks. However, if you go to Harbor Freight, there is, you ready for the part number? Item number 93984. It's a Sentec cheap non-contact thermometer. It's $23. Don't skip this step. If you want to get good results right off the bat, get yourself a non-contact thermometer. Uh, I'm going to put down here in this box the part number and the price from Harbor Freight. Obviously, all this information is subject to change. They might get rid of it. They might discontinue it. But for now, as of January 2012, you can get that item there. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the scroll saw. You'll come over here. I picked this up at Lowe's for about 100 bucks. You can go to Harbor Freight and get the Central Machinery Scroll Saw for 930112, that's the part number, for 70 bucks. If you don't want to spend that much money, you can buy a $4 coping saw, which is essentially a scroll saw blade. It's a very fine blade and sort of like a hacksaw kind of armature. And if you have a way to secure the Kydex while you cut it, you can get a very fine cut out of it. That coping saw item is 94848 and it's four bucks. So if you don't want to spend any money, that's a good way to go. The belt sander, again, this is a, uh, you know, just a standard, you know, regular Lowe's kind of belt sander. I picked it up for, again, about a hundred bucks. Uh, and uh, it's uh, really critical. It's great for matching the edges. If you don't want to spend the money on a belt sander, you can get a piece of sandpaper, like a 60 or an 80 grit, and tape it down to the bench and move the piece in relationship to the, to the sandpaper instead of the sandpaper in relationship to the piece. Uh, that's a great way to do it on a budget. That's the way I did it for a little while. It just requires that you cut a little more closely off the bat. If you use a belt sander, you can uh, you know, be very generous with your cuts and rough with your cuts and use it to do most of the matching. But if you're going to do something that's more by hand or without the belt sander, like you know, tape your uh, sandpaper down to the bench, then you're going to obviously have to be more accurate in your initial cuts. This, uh, these range from $40 to $100 at Harbor Freight. So, I mean, 
40 bucks isn't that much to save yourself a lot of time. All right, so let's move on over here to the rivet press. Uh, this rivet press, you can get, this is the one ton rivet press. You can get a half ton rivet press, obviously, at uh, Harbor Freight, again. I mean, where else are you gonna get cheap stuff? That's item number 3551. It's a central machinery press for 30 bucks. Uh, you can get this actual unit at knifekits.com where it is milled and machined to accept their pro series uh, riveting tools. They machine something out of the uh, this plate here and they machine something out of the uh, actual uh, this, uh, this bar so that it will accept the, uh, the rivet tools. I did it the cheap way and I'm still doing it the cheap way. I'm using the knifekits.com journeyman level uh, die guide and die. This is K-R-Y D-J-S dash D-G. It's 12 bucks. And this is the quarter inch uh, die itself. That's K-R K-Y-R D-J-S dash eight. It's 25 bucks. And these things together make a, uh, a rivet press. If you don't want to spring for this, please do yourself a favor and spring for one of these guys. Don't I don't advise getting the, the hammering ones, those will just drive you crazy. And if you get one of these, you can use them in conjunction with your big giant clamps and use this and your bench to press your rivets, which is a good way to get started and a good way to save yourself some money. The next thing on our list is the buffing wheel. This is just a cheap, uh, you can get them on Amazon.com, they range from $35 and up. This one had I bought it for thirty-five bucks. It's the bottom line one. It uh, <laughs> it came with a couple buffing wheels, and uh, it is very poorly reviewed. However, it is doing quite well for me. I'm not. Uh, I'm you know I run it for long periods of time while I finish up these uh, holsters. It's got a you know range of RPMs, and it does not smell like burning electrical equipment when you run it, which is more than adequate for me. Uh, it comes with a certain number of uh, buffing wheels. They're mostly these softer uh, spiral spiral wheels. I do recommend getting this wheel. It's called a sisal wheel, and it's much more fibrous and tough, and it's great for uh, matching edges. It's, it's like everything that you want from a grinding wheel, but much, much finer. So it'll, uh, it'll round an edge, it'll match an edge, it'll blend the kydex a little bit, and it's a, it's a good thing to have. Just don't get carried away with it. Um, so between this and this, you can do a lot of fine finishing. All right, where are we? Let's talk about blue guns and replicas. Over here, I've generated a pretty hefty collection of blue guns and replicas uh, due to the uh, volume of orders that we've been getting for certain things. I just figured that I'd you know absorb the cost the first time, and obviously you know after that they start paying for themselves. Uh, I get these from alternateforce.com. They're about 35 bucks a piece. Uh, what I'm going to do is in the next few days after I release this video, it's going to be a video response to this. I'm going to set up a program where these can be lent to you. Uh, and the details of that will be uh, available in the video response that I make to this. It's going to be called Blue Gun Loaner Program. So uh, keep an eye out for that and you'll be able to find it through the channel. Uh, obviously, again, we'll come back over here. You're going to need a drill and drill bit of the appropriate size. I'm using quarter inch rivets, so I'm using a quarter inch drill bit. One thing that I don't have that I'd really like to get is a drill press. That's going to go a long way towards helping me make uh, clean uh, and well-aligned holes for the rivets. And uh, that's all the hardware, non-consumable hardware, that you're going to need uh, up to this point. What comes after that is consumable stuff, stuff that you'll use and will be consumed throughout the process. So, for instance, uh, Kydex is something you're going to need, you know? Uh, it's something that you're going to use, and it can't be reused. It's not a piece of equipment. You're going to build the holster with it, and that's going to be that. Um, you can get it from knifekits.com. They have everything. They have a huge selection of uh, colors and thicknesses. And until the end of February uh, of 2012, they're running a uh, coupon code. Uh, just enter Philly EDC. Cal 
Gotta love the neighbors, right? Capital P, capital EDC, Philly EDC, and get a, a few percent off your purchase. So that's pretty awesome of them. So anyway, there's Kydex, every color you want. There's also the rivet eyelets. People ask, which ones should I get? Obviously, they tell you on the website which thickness of rivet is appropriate for your application. However, I have found that the rivets labeled KYSR9-100 are the quarter inch rivets for 0.093 Kydex. Even though it says for 0.093 Kydex, I use them on all three thicknesses. I rivet my uh, 060 thickness, my 080 thickness, and my 093 thickness Kydex because they are the most robust ones and I found that they are much less likely to split when I rivet them. And that's going to be something that you got to take into account. You're, going to, you're inevitably going to split a few rivets. It happens. That's just the name of the game. Uh, you, there are steps that you can take to avoid it and to minimize the likelihood of that happen, happening, but uh, you know, plan on that happening. However, the 093 thickness Kydex rivets, the you know, SR9 100s, are the best ones, I think. And they roll and secure even the sheets of 060 more than adequately. So I recommend those above all the other ones. What's next? Foam. Uh, there's all sorts of resources for foam. If you don't want to go the uh, sort of consumer route, you can get yourself a very dense neoprene style foam. This foam is from usaknifemakers.com and a sheet like this costs $23 and it's extremely dense. Uh, you can get a sheet exactly like this from knifekits.com for $21. There's not that much uh, skin in the game there, you know. Uh, they're, they're pretty much equal, I would say. I generally prefer this these days because of the density and density gives good definition. However, you can get great definition with the Knife Kits foam as well. Uh, you might have to go with who's got it in stock, who can get it faster, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of factors involved there. Or if you can find an industrial application uh, or industrial source for it, you might be able to get it cheaper there. But foam's consumable. Uh, enough heat and enough pressure and enough time, it'll run down and start giving you weird results. So plan on refreshing your foam more than occasionally if you start doing a lot of holsters. So that's that there. We can also get sandpaper. I recommend the Purple 3M Pro Grade Sandpaper. It's really great. It holds up to the wet sanding process, which is how we finish our holsters. Uh, it doesn't disintegrate very rapidly the way like uh, conventional sandpaper does. Uh, it's really great. It removes uh, material in a smooth and consistent way and it doesn't really break down. You know how some, some sandpaper will break down as you use it and leave uh, debris of the sandpaper itself on the, on the material you're working with? This is much less likely to do that, so I recommend that stuff. I get it at Home Depot, but for some reason I haven't found it at our local Lowe's, so Home Depot is a source for that. I f don't have a price on that, but uh, you know it varies. So let's go talk about uh, hardware. There's a couple different kinds. So let's talk about hardware. You're going to need some sort of hardware to attach your belt loops to your holster unless you find a way or devise a way to make them all integral. Uh, so what you can do is you can get what's called Chicago screws which is going to be a male and female uh, screw set and uh, as you can see here you know they're also referred to in some cases as binding posts. Um, you're going to have a male side and a female side as you can see and uh, you know, they go together and you can run one side through the belt loop and the other side through the face of the holster. These little shiny guys are available at knifekits.com. This one's flat headed. They are part number KKCS8250BK-10. A 10 pack of these, and we're talking about a 10 pack of the pair, is $4. And uh, I haven't really had any problems with these at all. If you're serious about keeping them tight, you can lock tight these bad boys or you can use an o-ring, like a quarter inch o-ring, that's available at any auto supply store. Uh, and uh, go ahead and feel free to use these guys. There's another place right around the right in my area called McMaster Car. I'll put the website down here. Uh, 
they are a supplier of all sorts of hardware like if you need it they have it now, they have a extremely dense and incomprehensible website you have to know exactly what you're looking for to navigate it and the only reason I found these is because a friend of mine sent me the link directly to the parts for it um, otherwise I would have been totally flabbergasted at the uh, <laughs> at, at their layout um, they're local to me so they deliver these parts about as fast as a pizza so if I ever run out of these I call them and in a matter of hours uh, they're at my house so if you want black Phillips head hardware, you can, uh, these parts are available separately, not together. Uh, you can get part number 96640A123. Uh, it's these screws and a pack of 100 for $9. Uh, and you can get 99024A327, the binding posts, and they're in a pack of $25 for 100 So per 100 pack, these are approximately the same price within a few dollars of the knife kits ones. Uh, you basically just pay a little bit extra f to have it black and badass. And uh, I've been going with these guys because I, I just like the look of them. Uh, I throw an O-ring in there and they're, and they're real solid. And uh, that concludes our uh, list of hardware. I mean, obviously, aside from, you know, knives and pliers and screwdrivers and stuff that you should already have as a, as a DIYer. Uh, that's all the stuff uh, with the part numbers and the prices. So now we're going to get on to uh, the next step, which is uh, selecting your Kydex. So our next uh, order of events here is to select uh, the Kydex we uh, want to use. Now, generally, you know, in terms of sites like uh, KnifeKits.com, uh, Kydex is available in three thicknesses. You've got 0 0.060 thickness, and we're measuring in fractions of an inch here which is pretty flexible uh, but you know it's all going to be durable pretty flexible and this holster here is made out of that thickness it yields a great definition and uh, it's really easy to work with um, it is a little finicky in terms of uh, the heat if you overheat it it will change its form extremely quickly and uh, shrink up and do funny things so uh, if you are committed to paying attention to it during the course of working with it, it gives you really great results. Uh, the advantage of the flexibility is that you spend a little less time dialing in the retention because it's inherently flexible. So it's not going to, uh, excuse me a second, I don't want to knock the tripod. But uh, you can get great definition without having to relieve too many areas to accommodate your retention needs. So you can just sort of get that guy in there like that and get really good uh, retention out of the flexible material. Now people say, oh, but it's so flexible. You know, look how flexible and, and flimsy it is. Well, look at it this way, right? You ever dent your car? You know, it's got that big sheet of metal, and that metal, when it's nice and flat, is really flexible. But as soon as you put a dent in it, that dent is really hard to get out because a fold creates structural strength. So it might be, you know... It may be flimsy in this form, but when it comes, but in terms of this fold here, it's actually extremely sturdy. So the more folds you put in it, you know, obviously, you know, the opening is a little flexible, but it's extremely lightweight, extremely low profile, and the more folds you put in it, the uh, the tougher it gets. The here we go. The next one is the .080 thickness. Um, until very recently, the uh, large variety of Kydex colors was, was only available in uh, 0.080 thickness. And uh, that meant that colorful holsters like olive or uh, brown or what have you were... Uh, I was sort of forced to use that thickness for these colors. Now, obviously, you know, you can see here that you can get great definition out of it. You might have to push the heat a little higher. We're talking like almost 360 degrees uh, and sort of get into the get dangerously t close to the realm where you start to get shrinking and glossing. But you can really you can really get some good definition out of it. Now, it is not quite as it is not even nearly as flexible it is. 
very stiff, very firm. So there's 0 0.080, and there's the 0 0.060. Um, you do have to relieve some areas to loosen up the retention. Otherwise, it is uh, a very stiff holster indeed. Uh, now, as of recently, the uh, these colors are available in 060 thickness, so I'm going to be switching. And the final one is the 096. There are some people, like uh, Gunfighters Inc., for instance, who make all of their gear out of the... Uh, or 093, rather. Um, they make all of their gear out of that because of the uh, durability issues, and uh, they want to be absolutely 100% sure that... Uh, the gear has incredible longevity and toughness. And what they use for that is this very uh, robust uh, material. You can, like all the other ones, push the heat and get some good definition. However, it's so inflexible that you kind of have to relieve it a lot. I mean, in order to have a um, holster that uh, really worked for me, I had to warm it up and relieve out a lot of that definition. Uh, because of the stiffness of the material. Uh, today we're going to be making a holster out of the 060 thickness uh, Coyote Tan for this SIG P226. And when we get back, we're going to get started on that. We're going to get started on that. So this, I guess, is what you could call the drawing board. This is where you start to get an idea uh, or implement, rather, your idea of how you want your holster to look. And you cut your Kydex based on uh, your, your overall plan. Now, I know that um, more or less all I need is a six and a half inch piece wide holster, uh, or a piece to start with, because that's going to uh, accommodate any kind of curving or uh, small warping that could occur during the pressing process, and it gives me enough room that I can have a sufficiently wide holster in terms of weight distribution and uh, conforming curvature to the body without being really excessive. So, uh, you know, measure it out, give yourself a little extra room. I'm going to do six and a half inches wide and uh, let's say eh, let's say about seven and a half inches uh, long here on the back. Obviously this is when you start to think about, you know, the cant of the holster in relationship to uh, in relationship to uh, you know the belt line and all this stuff, but uh, we're kind of dictated uh, by the order form here. So the customer makes the rules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure this out six and a half inches wide, and uh, then I'm going to cut the front and the back face here. So I'm going to do six and a half inches. Now, if you have, you know, room left over or uh, pieces left over, those can turn into mag carriers or other accessories. If you slip and make a mistake with your razor blade, you can go over to Sentry Gun Leather's channel and see his little tutorial on how to heal your Kydex and the self-healing properties of uh, heating it up and uh, erasing your errors. So you can just, you know, fold it, break it, nice clean edge. So, that's six and a half inches wide. Let's say seven and a half inches tall to give us a little leeway. Uh, because if you, uh, if you cut it too close to the muzzle, it'll bunch up and fold in a funny way. So maybe let's, we'll do eight inches so we can make sure that we get a nice, uh, nice clean shape. We don't want any bunching or folding. You know, just like underpants. So, we'll make our mark. I use these uh, Stabilo marking pencils, uh, and uh, these things work great. You can get them at Blick Art Supply. They wash right off. You don't have to worry about the graphite smearing or, or any of that nonsense. So, do a little cut. There's that, and there's that piece. So now, there's our back piece. We know where the gun is going to go in here. Get it all lined up. And go ahead and trace on 
there. So you can have an idea of where it's going to go when you uh, when you're in a hurry to line it back up in the uh, in the press once it's hot. Now, here's something to consider. I don't want the Kydex to have to fight to wrap itself around the grip here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little mark like that, right about there, and then right about here, and then this whole area here. I'm going to cut that out so that the Kydex will wrap more vigorously around the trigger guard area. You know, it's not going to get pulled, it's not going to sort of, uh, I'm not going to have to fight it in the press. So, that might not be 100% strictly necessary, but it feels good in my head to know that, that that's happening. So, I'm going to cut that off camera. Uh, you know, you'll see it when it's time to go into the press. So, we're going to measure the front. I want the front of the holster, let's say, Let's say it's, uh, let's do six inches. Why not? We're gonna have a small amount of waste, but I'd rather uh, waste a little bit than, than fall short here. So we're gonna trim this guy here. Make your mark. Line it up. Make your cut. And obviously I'll make the identical yet mirrored cut on this piece of Kydex. So, uh, when we get back, we'll be warming the Kydex and talking about uh, our heat source. At this point, we have our first sheet of Kydex warming up in the toaster oven. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these pieces of foam and I'm going to put it on top up here to warm up the foam. Because what happens is when you put a hot thing next to a cold thing, you're going to get a transfer of heat energy. And when you put the warm kydex into the cold press, you can potentially lose a lot of heat that way. And when, you know, they say strike when the iron's hot, you don't want it to be cooling down too rapidly as you're working with it. So I'm going to go ahead and put it up there and try to infuse a little warmth into this foam uh, so we can ensure that we have a, a sufficient working time and good definition. I cover this material in a video called uh, how to, there's two videos called how to get a great definition every time where I talk about um, heating the Kydex slowly uh, and monitoring the temperature precisely. And I'm going to go over some of that information here as well so you don't have to you know, hunt for all the videos and what have you. So when I mold the Kydex, I do it one side at a time. And that saves me a lot of uh, headache in terms of making sure that everything lines up in the press or things don't move or you know shift in relationship to each other. So I do one side, I know that it's good, and what I can do is then I can use it to line the other piece up and be uh, relatively assured that I'm going to have two sheets that match pretty closely uh, when, I, uh, when I get them out of the press. That way I don't have to accommodate any weirdness that's happened in the molding process. A good thing to note is that if you make a mistake in this process, and as long as the Kydex doesn't shrink, warp, or overgloss, like if you just mold it wrong, or if it's crooked, or in some way unsatisfactory, like not enough definition, you can just throw it right back in the oven, and it'll relax all your impressions right out of it. Um, the self-healing properties of Kydex are really, uh, really great. For <laughs> they give you a lot of leeway in terms of uh, making your molds. So, uh, what I'm doing now is I have my oven set to the lowest temperature. And it's important before you even start making your first holster to do a little exploration uh, with your heat gun and your heat source, I mean your uh, temp gun and your heat source, and get a ballpark idea of what temperature the material is in relationship to the position of your temperature dial. Because what I've found uh, after using this little guy for a while is that when it says 150 here, it's really 250 inside this oven or the material itself heats up to 250. And what it does is it cycles on and cycles off and so you, like that, you can hear it. And uh, when it reaches a certain temperature, it will shut back off. But that doesn't mean the Kydex isn't really getting kind of hot in there. Um, you don't really need like Kevlar gloves. I just use mechanics work gloves to uh, manipulate and handle this hot material. I mean, I was 
uh, I was an auto mechanic for a while, so I'm not. I'm pretty used to beating the crap out of my hands. For those of you with dainty hands, you may want more protection, but then I might have to scorn you mercilessly about your dainty hands. Um, let's take a look in there. Yeah, you see, right now it's at 232 degrees, the material itself, and I've only got it set to 150. And also, you can get uneven heating across the surface of the material, potentially if you've got a really small oven. So we've got 212, 215, 207, 203. What I do is I give it a little rotate. I don't generally flip it top face to face inside the oven. I'll just give it a 180 degree turn on the tray and then turn it up a little bit. If I were to preheat the oven and preheat the tray and turn it all the way up to 350 degrees, and then put the Kydex in there, that Kydex would shrinky dink and get really shiny because it can't handle that kind of sudden temperature change. Um, if you have a larger oven, obviously you can, uh, since there's more air and less direct heat inside that larger oven, you can get away with uh, maybe setting your temperature and you know, uh, putting the Kydex in and letting it come up to temperature uh, with the oven or since the heat's not as direct, maybe setting it to a higher temperature initially, it won't shock the material. But in this little sort of uh, dorm, I guess I, call, I guess I guess I call this a dorm-sized toaster oven, I, uh, I'm subjecting this material to a lot of direct heat. So initially I'll turn it up slowly, but as I get you know above 200 degrees, once this guy starts showing over 280 degrees, I can turn it up faster and faster. I'm less likely to shock it. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another temperature check. Yep, 250. So I'm going to let that hang out there like that. And uh, we'll, when I get back, what I'm going to do is I'll be at the stage where it's finally coming out of the oven. I don't think you need to watch me turn up the oven and check the temperature and turn up the oven and check the temperature. Just take your time and uh, monitor your temperature. And once you get to about 350, maybe even a little more if you're feeling daring and you've got a little experience with it. You know, once you get to that point where you kind of have an idea of how the material is going to react, then you uh, put it in your press and move on to the next step. So where we're at now, if you'll uh, pardon me shouting, is we're getting into the last couple moments of heating this guy up in the oven. It is currently... 333 degrees in the oven and what I'm doing is I'm warming this top piece of foam on top of the uh, on top of the oven and just like um, for the same reason that I gave for warming up the foam I'm warming up the gun as well because it too can be a, uh, a place for the heat to go for, for the heat to leave the Kydex so to get really good definition like I said in that uh, pair of videos it's uh, important to heat everything that's going to come in contact with the kydex. So I'm warming this up and I'm warming up the foam. A uh, word of advice, I, it's been reported to me by a couple DIYers who have uh, put a polymer frame gun in the press. Uh, they encountered some problems with the grip uh, warping or squishing just a little bit. I would recommend put a magazine in the gun before you put it in the press. And if you have to put the whole gun in the press, you know, try and like maybe leave some of the grip out of the direct pressure area. Um, if not, put a magazine filled up with snap caps, give it some structure and put the magazine in the grip. Otherwise you could be uh, flexing that grip a little bit too much on your polymer frame handgun. Uh, but aside from that, I, I haven't damaged any magazines or accessories or guns in the press as of yet. So, you know, knock on wood. But just a word of advice to those of you who are planning on, you know, making a Glock holster or an M&P holster or any, any, such, uh, any such gun there. So, let's take another quick peek at this temperature. There we go. 353. I'm going to now work extremely quickly and, you know, like I said, strike while the iron's hot and get that out of the oven 
into the press and ready to rock and roll. So like I said, remember you did put some markings on this which you are now grateful for so you don't have to go, oh man, where did I mean to, uh, to lay that gun out there? So this guy's going in there in the foam. work quickly. It's good to have a press that you can manipulate quickly because the faster you can work with your press, the faster you can get, you know, the, the less time the kydex has to cool down without taking a shape. Um, more pressure is always better in terms of uh, forming your material. I do this by hand to a point and then what I do is these, uh, these posts here are cross drilled and I'm going to take a dowel, a uh, punch or you can put a screwdriver in there and you can crank them down really freaking tight. More tighter is more better. Um, what you won't see in this video is the use of a vacuum form. I have not yet had the chance to build one or experiment with one. Uh, they are a uh, unknown element to me. When we get busier in the future, we might start looking into that, but for now, a hand press, a hand-operated press is where we're at in this project. Um, if you would like to respond to this video with a how-to on how to make a vacuum press and demonstrate that piece of equipment, I would be very appreciative, as would probably many viewers of this video. That could be a good tutorial there. So now this guy, your press might make noise, it might creak, it might pop. That's how you know you're doing it right. So, here you go, this guy's clamped down. And uh, after the jump, we'll be uh, opening up the press and showing you the results of our results of our uh, work up to this point. So our Kydex has been in the press for uh, about 10 to 12, anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Let it cool down all the way. Uh, so I'm going to unlock this press, get it out of here, and show you our results. I currently have the other piece warming up in the oven. You let the oven temperature come back down a little bit you know, you reset it back to zero so you're not putting your Kydex into a screaming hot oven, therefore shocking it. Yeah, it's a little meticulous, it's a little time consuming, but you, as with anything, you get into it what you, you get out of it what you put into it. So if you're putting in care and considerate effort, you're going to get out good results. So here we go. There's our impression. Can you ask for a crisper, cleaner mold than that for your Kydex holster. I think not. That's about, it's about as precise as you're going to get, I think. So I'm going to go on ahead, heat up that other piece, uh, press that, and when we get back, I'm not going to show you, you know, heating up the other thing. You just, you know, take this piece and your new piece and line them up in the press together to ensure that it uh, it all lines up. But uh, that's not something that I'm going to make you guys sit through. When we get back, we're going to get to the uh, rough cut and uh, planning phase. Yeah. Look at that. It's pretty good, I think. Pleased with that. I hope the customer's pleased with that as well. So, after the jump, using movie magic, we will be on to another phase of this project. And we're back, and you can see here that we have our two faces that are already completed and molded, and we're going to get involved in laying out the uh, rough cut dimensions of uh, how this holster is going to be. Now, it's a good idea to know in advance how large your belt loops are, or what the minimum distance between the, your mounting holes needs to be in order to accommodate them. I know that, you know, based on, you know, the belt loops that I can, you know, pre-make, 
that they need to be two and five eighths inches apart. This is just a scrap one that I'm showing you guys here. But you know, in order to mount these holes, the belt loops need to be two and five eighths inches apart at a minimum distance. So what I'm gonna, what I've done is in advance I've marked out two and five eighths inches on my ruler. Um, I basically boosted this from my wife's sewing kit because it's clear, which makes it really easy to lay stuff out. So uh, I feel that this is an adequate clearance for just about anybody's hand to come in and get a good grip on this holster. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave this edge where it is. And then using my cutting mat here, I'm gonna orient this and uh, line it up with one of these lines here. And I can see that uh, on the other side, if I want these, the two halves of the holster to be the same height here, I'm gonna come in and mark that mark that line generally right about there. Uh, the customer requested a low sweat shield, so I'm going to make sure that it only comes up about yay, yay high, like so. Like that. That'll be a nice low sweat shield there. Now, I know my minimum distance is two and five eighths inches, so I can make one measure down from the top, maybe quarter to half an inch. Make your mark there. I'm going to make another mark over here at the bottom. That's my two and five eighths inches. And now I don't want to go lower than the muzzle, so I'm going to scribe my first line across the holster here, like so. And that's going to be the rough dimension on that side. Now on this side, I'm going to do the same two and five eighths inches, like that. And I'm going to scribe on this side. So that's going to be the general layout. Now we can take our box cutter, knife of some sort, and I'm going to score and crack this edge just like I did the other one. Now it doesn't have to be perfect because remember you're going to sand. If you were going to not use a belt sander, if you were stuck with manual sanding, I'd take a lot more care to cut these edges. However, I have a belt sander, so I'm going to cut kind of roughly and depend on the belt sander to uh, even up that edge a little bit. So I'm going to cut over here like this, like so. Cut like so, yeah. And you can be mean with it, it's going to be fine. I use a pliers because it's easier than using my hands there like that. So what I'm going to do for the sweat shield is I'm going to use the scroll saw, but not before. Put the gun back in the mold. It's going to fit perfectly. It won't move around. And then what I can do is I can put the other face in the mold. Oh, now I can just line it up like so. Make a mark there like that. And correspond over and know that that's the height that's going to be. And I can flip this guy over here and know that that's that height there, like this. Like that. See those correspond all the way around to the marks on the other side. And then I'm going to scribe there and there. And here's my sheet. So I'm going to draw it out kind of rough because I can sand, I'm gonna make my, get an idea of where I want this to be. And you can be as, you know, obviously as artistic as you want here. What I can do is I can use the grid on this, this cutting mat to make sure that everything lines up and is square in a usual and predictable and you know, perfect kind of way. So now that that's done, I'm going to bring this guy over here, cut like that, and cut like that. Remember, we're going to belt sand. I'm just reducing the amount of material that I want to sand in that location. I'm not cutting with any kind of precision. Uh, obviously, precision has its time and place, and we're about to get involved in that. Um, 
But for this section here, we don't need uh, we don't need that much that much more precise than this because we're going to belt sand these two edges flush and we're going to get involved in some sanding here after we've cut it. So I'm going to meet you guys over at the scroll saw, show you how I cut that out.